Hello and welcome to this edition of Crush Your Mountain Wellness. I have with me today Miss Leslie Davis. Now, you're going to really, really enjoy this podcast. I'm going to tell you why. Okay, as you know, we deal with health, wellness, and personal growth. Well, Leslie's story is truly amazing. I have been looking for individuals who wanted to help others like myself with weight loss. And one of the things that I always discovered was that individuals are often protecting themselves physically somehow or compensating somehow. Well, Leslie Davis is a six-time author. Her first book, You Can't Eat Love, How Learning to Love Yourself Can Change Your Relationship with Food, is in the Amazon Top 20 in at least two categories since it was released in 2021. Like so many, it took a moment of extreme sadness for her to realize something had to change. I think in so many ways, that's all of us. I think COVID did that to many of us. And so this is so important. Now she says this, I began on a journey to fix what I thought was broken. That was when I discovered that the myself whole in my heart. That was when I realized I was not broken, just uninformed. I did not know how to love myself. But now she's on a mission to help others find their why, to go on any journey of self-discovery to introduce themselves or to or introduce themselves to their, their best friend, their very, their very best friend, and that's themselves, you know, and also to live their best life. One of the results of learning to love herself and changing her relationship with food was that she not only lost, but she has kept off 100 pounds since 2017. She's going to be 65. I think she's going to be, she, she, she says she's 65. I think we're going to put her about 49 on that, okay? And, but in August, she's going to hit, she's going to hit that number. And among her passions now are deadlifting. She's currently deadlifting 225 pounds. She's up to eight times, okay? And also, she bench presses 90 pounds. Now, think about it. This is a woman that lost all this weight, but she's also doing things to not just keep it off, but realize what the emotional connection is. And that's why I have her here. Her approach is one of stories from her own life. She, she's real, raw, and she's honest about her struggles. And she uses that to help others to see that they're not alone and that they can overcome their struggles. Leslie Davis, welcome to Crush Your Mountain. Henry, I am so excited to be here. I've been counting down the moments until we started talking all day long. I kept looking at the clock. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? Because I am really looking forward to this conversation. Well, thank you so much. Well, you know, we were talking a little bit before, and there are so many points that we hit on. And, you know, you're an incredible individual with the struggles that you overcome, the struggles that you dealt with. But you've also gone on to help so many others, not just here in this country, but in other countries as well. Am I right? That, so, that's right. So first of all, before we jump into that, tell us a little bit about that personal struggle with weight, because there's so many individuals that have come to me and they say, I want to keep it off. I want to take care of it. I don't want to continue looking like this. What can I do? And a lot of them are women who are confiding in a guy. And I know that they're so brave in doing that. However, a woman's voice can speak to a woman's heart. So please tell us your story. Well, like so many other people, I struggled with my weight for most of my life. And I would follow, you know, whatever diet it was. And I did everything from the liquid protein to, to you name it, you know, the packaged foods and all those kinds of things. And while they provided a temporary fix to the, the number on the scale, they never provided a final solution to why the number kept growing on the scale. And it wasn't until I started doing what I call the hard work. And the hard work was really addressing the mental and emotional issues that I had. 
um, and really digging down and understanding why I was using food like so many other people, why I was using food in times of stress, sadness, happiness, what, you know, whatever it was. And what I came to realize is that I was using food as my drug of choice to name, to, to numb the pain that I felt from whatever it was that I was feeling, be it sadness or happiness. And the reason that I was using food to numb the pain is I did not have any understanding of how to experience the emotion, be it sadness or joy. Because how many times do you hear, how many times might you have said, when you, you express to someone or someone expresses to you, I'm feeling sad. And your response is, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Okay, so then the person is thinking, okay, well, this is someone that I know, like, and trust, and they're telling me I shouldn't feel this way, but this is how I'm feeling, and it sets up tension, and we have to do something with tension, and that's where that stress eating, emotional eating comes in, and we start doing something so that we can stop the pain, stop the tension, and then the weight comes on and the weight keeps coming on. And then we can go on a diet for a short period of time. But I call that white knuckling, how you're holding on just as tight as you can. But as soon as life happens, you let go and, you know, all heck breaks loose. Right. But what I realized is if I was going to um, have complete change, if I was going to really become the best version of myself, I needed to start with my emotions. And that was so scary because I needed to start naming the emotions that I was feeling. And it wasn't that I didn't know the names. I just didn't know the names of my emotions. And then the second part of that was to sit in the emotion for even just a short period of time and recognize that I could sit in that emotion. I could feel it. It would be okay and I didn't need to go to my drug of choice to numb the pain. And I tell people now, if I would have known how hard the journey was going to be, I don't know that I would have done it. But I'm grateful that I had no clue because I'm grateful for having come out on the other side. Now, I'm still continuing on because just like everybody else, we're always learning, right? Always learning, improving. And so now my mission is to help other people learn that you can name those emotions. We don't need to use our drug of choice food to numb the pain. We can feel the pain. We can enjoy our life and we can do what I say. We can stop filling the myself sized hole in my heart with food and start filling it with love for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, that resonates with me so much because so many individuals are doing that. You know, just speaking to so many different ones, uh, oftentimes they're self-medicating due to dealing with the aftermath of divorce or they're self-medicating just because of some issue in the past they, they carry with them into adulthood. Worst case scenario um, was one of my uh, one, one, of, one of my guests actually was telling us how she experienced so much trauma in her life that she was eating as part of the shield of protection. And many times we have to be determined to address those emotions. Like you said, to sit with your emotions because we actually have these emotions for every emotion that has a positive intent. It's, it's telling us something. So when you go to that point, when you are working with a client, uh, how do you get them to do that, to sit with their emotions? What, do, what techniques do you use? Or how, do you, how do you walk them through that? Well, what I usually do, because I can't be with people 24-7, so what I usually do is where I started. I tell them to, you know, when they start feeling these things, when it starts getting overwhelming, grab pen and paper mm. and start having a conversation with what I call your very best friend in the whole wide world, which is yourself. Because 
what I realized for myself, and I see this in other people, we are desperate to be heard. And especially if we have experienced any kind of trauma or our feelings have been denied, our emotions have been denied, you know, what, whatever it is, we're desperate to be heard. And I don't know about you, but sometimes if I keep hoeing the same road, I get people rolling their eyes or they shut me down or, you know, whatever. They're, they get tired, right? And that's okay. They get tired. They're human. But the one person who is always with you, the one person who is always willing to listen, the one person who is empathetic towards you at all times is your very best friend in the whole wide world, which is yourself. So what I started doing, and this is what I tell people that I work with to do, grab pen and paper and start having that conversation in writing with yourself about what you're feeling. And at the same time, say to yourself, of course you feel that way. Why wouldn't you feel that way? Start acknowledging that the feeling that is being experienced is okay, because of course, you know, if somebody does something that causes you to become angry, of course you feel that way. This is what they did. Why wouldn't you feel that way? So acknowledge it because it is okay to feel. Now, I wanna get really clear on something because I tell this to people all the time. We have choices, and this is really, really important, especially with our feelings and our emotions. We have choices. Someone can do something, and we have a choice as to how we react or how we feel. No one can make you anything except reservations for dinner, and I prefer at a five-star restaurant. Ah, you and I both. <laughs> <laughs> so let's stop saying that so-and-so made me something because they didn't. All they can make you is reservations for dinner. You have a choice as to how you react. And I teach people to start holding on to, you know, control what you can control. You have no control over anybody else. So part of what you can control is how you react to other people and how you react to the words that people are saying, the actions that people are taking. But you do not have to pick up everything that they put down. And sometimes people will speak words that are very, very hurtful. And we have a choice. We can pick those words up and say, you know what? I feel very sad as a consequence of the words that you said. Or our other option is we can let those words fall with what I call a thud and a splat. And the mess goes all over their shoes. And we just give them one of those looks and we change the subject. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me think of Viktor Frankl, the um, oh, psychologist. That, yeah, he said the statement, he said, between stimulus and response is the power to choose. And so oftentimes we are in knee-jerk reaction. Right. And it's not just in terms of, in terms of dealing with people, it's often in terms of dealing in, in oftentimes dealing with ourselves where something comes up and we react and sometimes we react with a pint of ice cream or we might react with something else yeah, exactly and um i i absolutely love victor frankel oh my gosh i've got so many of his quotes all over the place but i mean it's a very true statement between that stimulus and that response you know there is the power to choose and one of the things that I teach people is we have to create a boundary with ourselves before we can ever expect to have a boundary with others. And part of the boundary with ourselves is teaching ourselves how to be kind to ourselves. So, for example, if you drop a dish and you break it instead of saying, oh, my gosh, I'm so clumsy and, you, you know, I'm not going to even go through the whole discussion because I don't want to plant any seeds. But you get the idea. Instead of saying to yourself, oh, my gosh, I'm so clumsy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know what? My hands were slippery. I really wasn't paying attention because I was having a great thought at the moment and I missed the dishwasher. Or whatever happened, you know, what is, is. Stop making excuses for it. It just is. OK. And so the dish hit the ground and it broke, you know, OK. It, so a dish broke. It's not the end of the world. We clean up the mess and we move forward. But when, when we are speaking to ourselves in an unkind way, 
And then we're asking the world to treat us with kindness. The world gets confused Mm -hmm. because actions speak louder than words. And when the world is observing how we treat ourselves, we are teaching the world how to treat us. We also teach us how to treat us. So it's really important that we start with becoming aware of how we think about ourselves, how we speak about ourselves, and how we act towards ourselves. That's so very vital and important. Now, I wanted to ask you about this. You have your first, your book that's so popular out there, okay? And we want to ask you this. You have a companion journaling book. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how to use it in one you know, in conjunction with the other? Well, the journal is the journal book is called So I Said to Myself, and it's filled with prompts. And a lot of the prompts are helping you focus on the positives in life. And the reason that I created the journal is oftentimes uh, when we start to write our thoughts, we don't know where to begin. And so this gives people an opportunity to figure out where to begin. And it's kind of like, you know, your bicycle with training wheels, because after about a month or so of writing in, so I said to myself, you should, you probably will feel free enough, you know, just to pick up a regular pretty notebook and continue on. But the other thing, it was very important to me that we focus on the positive things in life. And so one of the questions is, what are some of the things that you're celebrating today? What was a good thing that happened today? What were you excited about today? So that we are looking at, looking for the the good because where our focus is, is where our focus is, right? And as a consequence of focusing on some of the good things, especially when we're struggling, when we are struggling, it's easy to find the negative. Oh my gosh, I blew my diet today. I ate that whole half gallon of you know, chocolate ice cream, Rocky Road. I ate that whole bag of kisses, you know, wh- whatever the heck it is you did. You spend your time beating yourself up. And what I believe is that we just acknowledge, okay, so I ate a bag of kisses. What was really going on? And move forward. But the journal helps you look for the positives so that you can start seeing that, yes, there are some positives in your world. And then you have the conversation with your very best friend in the whole wide world talking about these positives. Now, that doesn't mean that you never go to the negative because, yes, you are going to go to the negative. But we don't want to live in the negative because that does not move us forward. That leaves us stuck. Well, when someone finds themselves in a negative space, uh, what steps can they take to climb out of it? Well, the first thing that I recommend is that you grab pen and paper and you list at least five to seven things that you're grateful for. Mm -hmm. And I learned this one on a day when, oh my gosh, I was struggling so badly. And I called one of my sisters, uh, my youngest sister, and I told her, and she said, write down 10 things that you're grateful for. And it was such a bad day. It took me eight hours to come up with 10 things. And I'm not talking about 10 deep things. I'm talking about like the sun came up today. But it was, I was in just such a dark place. However, by the time I got through, I was not in that dark place. So that's why if people are struggling and they feel as if they're stuck and they can't move forward, I recommend grab a pen and paper and write down five to seven things that you're grateful for. Do not get fancy. You know, don't get fancy. Meet you where you are. If it's a really bad day, And the best that you can come up with is the sun came up today. I got out of bed. Then that's, that's what you write down. Meet you where you are. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it's so interesting, you know, uh, yeah, I remember my grandmother, you would say, you better count your blessings, you know, and it's such a, a thing that all these old sayings, all the simple practices that we heard when we were kids are so true that they are timeless that have benefits, physical benefits. Eat your breakfast, eat your, eat your vegetables, um, go to bed at a decent hour, 
Keep chewing your food. Don't swallow anything down. Count your blessings. You know, just simple things that have monumental effects for our health and well-being. You know, so you've done so many remarkable things with your clients and with individuals, but you've also traveled overseas. Now, I remember, if my memory serves me correctly, you serve um, a community there in, is it South Africa? Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Okay. Which is right above South Africa. And about this, yeah. So, for, the, so, for the older people, it was Rhodesia. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so tell us about your work there and, and, um, and are you going back anytime soon or? Well, I hope to go back soon, you know, as soon as it's the, the health crisis is over and it's easier to fly on planes. Um, but what I do there is I work with two young, amazing women, uh, Mercy and Betty, and we have a sewing school. And I support Mercy and Betty by helping keep a roof over their hat, over them and the Betty's nieces and Mercy's two daughters. But they teach other women how to sew. Um, and so we have sewing classes, sewing schools, and the purpose is to help the women have economic freedom uh, because Africa, I don't know if many people are aware of this, but Africa is very much a patriarchal continent. Yeah. And when the women marry, they absolutely belong to the husband's families. And some of these um, African countries where the economy went into the tank, like Zimbabwe, the, the men fled to South Africa to make money. They would send money home for a short while, and then life was good in South Africa. They took up with somebody else, so the money stopped coming. So you have these women living with children living you know, in a state of destitution. And unlike the United States, they don't have social security. They don't have any kind of social services or anything like that. So when the people there say, I have nothing to eat, they have nothing to eat. Um, so we, we help young women and older women too, and even some men learn how to sew so that they can get in their community and make clothes for people in their community and generate revenue. Um, and be able to work from their homes and things like that. So anyway, that's really exciting. And I, I love, love, love when I get to go over there because we always start a sewing class and then I get to work with everybody for a whole week before I come back. But one of my favorite stories is we had a young woman who didn't even know how to hold a pair of scissors. So on a Monday, she had no clue how to hold a pair of scissors. And on Friday, she had made a dress. Wow, that's amazing. So what is it like working with a population that virtually has nothing like that? It causes it caused me to really understand um, how I can make a better impact. You know, um, sending clothing from the US over to Africa does not help them it actually destroys their economy because you're taking away from the, the people sewing the native clothing. Um, I mean, seriously, Americans sending clothing to Africa has destroyed a section of their economy. Uh, it also helps me to see selfishness here in the U.S. Um, and, and to be, uh, I, I guess I can be a little bit more callous towards people who complain <laughs> because, uh, you know, if your electricity, I mean, back last year, you know, last year we had, you know, that big freeze where we were without power for several days. And while it was extremely inconvenient, it was very, very cold. Um, when I go to Zimbabwe, a lot of times when I'm there for about three weeks, we don't have power for three weeks. Yeah in running water. So it's opened up my eyes, you know, to what, what is in the world. However, having said all the bad stuff, I also see people who take great joy in the little things who get excited about the things that they can do, who see possibility, who, um, 
who are excited to learn, who believe in themselves, and they celebrate and they worship God all the time. And there's nothing better than church in Africa. I know that they can they can kind of raise the roof. Uh, uh, yeah, and half the time the roof is a blue tarp. Wow. You know, I'll tell you, it does give perspective to where you are in relation to other countries. And it's not just the African countries. It's, you know, when you go to India, um, you see a lot of the same thing. And it's sad to say the climate change has done, has wreaked havoc uh, around the world. Uh, in the United States, uh, people don't see it as much, or at least they ignore it so much. But in places like Africa, in places like India, where they are, they, where they have subsistence farming as a way of life, where you have so many challenges in terms of a patriarchal society that doesn't put the value that they should on women. Uh, you know, even in, in India, they have the, the dowry burnings that you've heard of that terrible situation. Well, it really destroys a person's state of being when they can't take care of themselves. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that so kudos to you for, for doing oh. doing your part for on that. Tell us this, um, you know, what how would what steps can someone take? Let's say um, they, they have it, they don't they can't reach out to you, they can't reach out to me. Well what steps can they take? to start to make a change in themselves so that they can um, start to show their, their, their entire being, show holistic self love. Well, um, I always recommend that people start pretty much where I started, which is having that conversation with your very best friend in the whole wide world. Because as we learn to love ourselves, then everything else becomes so much easier. And the hold that whatever our drug of choice is, uh, it starts releasing itself. But the other thing is, um, if you're trying to lose weight, I would start writing down what you're eating. Just simply observe what it is that you're eating and then observe how you're feeling. Now, write it down without any kind of judgment. And this was how I started really discovering that my emotions and what I was eating were tied together. So if you're writing down what you're eating and you're observing how you're feeling, then you can start having a complete conversation with yourself. And the words that I usually recommend are what is really going on? So, for example, when you find yourself in the pantry and you've eaten that entire bag of uh, Oreo cookies, ask yourself instead of saying, oh, my gosh, I did it again. I blew it and whatever. Ask yourself what's really going on and then listen. Listen. As we start learning to listen to ourselves, the need to be heard starts easing up. You know, People say that, you know, that sort of self-reflection, that type of meditation is kind of woo-woo. But the fact of the matter is, so many individuals, really, they begin to learn, they begin to hear more within themselves. They, their own inner voice becomes not a screen, but now you have a conversation. And that's so important that we be honest with ourselves to have right. conversation. But well, and I'm glad that you mentioned be honest with ourselves because what I realized, and this is what I talk about I think, in the first chapter of the book, the lies that I told myself. Mm. Um, and we can lie to ourselves so easily, but the crazy thing is the world sees what's really going on. So the only person that we're lying to is me and myself, because we're three people. We're me, myself, and I. Me and myself are busy protecting us. I sees everything. So when we take on, you know, lying to ourselves about what's going on, we're only lying to ourselves and we're hurting ourselves. The world sees what's going on. So again, we get back to the boundary that we set with ourselves and the boundary that we're trying to set with other people. 
if we're busy lying to ourselves, the world observes it and they're thinking, well, I can't believe anything that they're saying because, you know, they're spending half their time lying. So we, we need to be honest with ourselves. And um, the, the thing that I found myself doing a whole lot of when I went on the journey was forgiving myself. I, I did a whole lot of forgiving of myself. Why? Well, you know what? I'm human. I'm learning. I'm making mistakes. I'm messing up as I go along. I forgave myself. I picked up. I moved on. I didn't keep on, you know, going over and over and over it because truthfully, and this goes back, you know, to having that conversation with ourselves. what we focus on is what fills our heart. What, what we fill our mind with fills our heart. And that's what comes out of our mouth. So that's why one of the reasons why in the, so I said to myself journal, I've got all these positive things. I want you to focus on positive things because what we fill our mind with is what we fill our heart with is what comes out of our mouth. Yeah. It was, Jesus made the statement. He said, out of the heart's abundance, the mouth speaks. Exactly. And so if the, the, the mind is the filter, the heart is the reservoir. But see, the mouth is the siphon. Exactly. So oftentimes, you're so right, we, pe people have to, what well, we have to fill our minds. And that's, that brings me to another thing that, that, I, 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 um, that just came up for me. And I just wanted to see what you thought about this. Now, um, you know, we're, we're both within the same age group, uh, and, and we were probably, I don't know, I, I, I know you probably just lived off of Lawrence Welcome Ballroom Dancing. Or really, did you, oh, oh, let's go real. About, let's get real about. It. Were you a rocker like I was a rocker back in the day? Well, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I didn't really get into the rock and roll, but only because, only because I lived in Venezuela during that period of time, hey, uh, and so we didn't really have the radio and all that kind of stuff. So we oh, we were right. limited to the, you know, our exposures. So I, I'm familiar with you know the Rolling Stones, the Monkees, the Beatles, but my exposure was limited. However, I will say, I know what you're talking about. Yes, Lawrence Wilk and all that, and put on any of the 60s, 70s music, and I can sing along as soon as they hit the first note. <laughs> well, the reason why I mentioned that is, you know, you know I, I remember when I was a kid, and my dad said, oh, these kids in their music. Here I am, you know, 40 years later, I'm going, these kids in their music. And what happens though is that what goes in their minds and dare i say what they're playing on the video games all these things are building up in the heart and look at the look at the, the problems that it's caused and the challenge is it's it, it's affecting our young people as well because hey they too are now taking on the weight what used to be called adult onset diabetes is now called just type two because we have children younger and younger and younger, 10 years old, who are obese. Yeah. Needlessly so. Well, and, and that goes back to something that really annoys me because there are multiple commercials where in my least favorite commercial is a Kit Kat commercial where there's a child on the other side of the bathroom door who is obviously very upset. And the mother is trying you know, to do whatever and pushes a Kit Kat under the door to, to make the child feel better. Yeah. Okay. They're trying to make the child feel better. And remember, you can't make anyone anything except reservations for dinner. Right. So this, this is what's being shown. If you're sad or you're mad or you're whatever, you just need a Kit Kat bar. Mm. Same thing with, I think it's the Snickers, the person who is, you know, hangry. hangry. Yeah. You know, you need a Snickers bar. Well, no. How about just, you know, some real food? But society and advertising, marketing is telling us over and over and over again, if you are sad, if you are whatever, and you don't want to feel it, not a problem. We got a food that is going to solve your problem. Instead of, as you mentioned, we've got kids who are horribly obese and they're setting themselves up to all kinds of problems. Instead of saying, you know, it, it seems like you're sad. Let me listen to you. It's easier for parents to shove food at them, shove an iPad at them, shove a computer at them, 
anything except engage because let, let's be real. It takes energy to listen to another person's problems. Yes. And so many parents these days don't invest in that energy. Themselves. No. Yeah. No, because it's cutting into their time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's the biggest challenge. Now, how do we separate our from our self love from being selfish? In other words, you know, you have a single parent could be a single dad and he's raising his he's trying to raise his sons and or his and daughters or, or a combination and in the meantime he's seeing this girl he's doing and then he's dating that girl or, you know or vice versa you know all these relationship things because he's got to have somebody okay uh how does that affect the development and growth of the child well what, what I came to understand is when we start seeking outside for what we are lacking inside, we're never really going to get it. And the reason is we are empty on the inside. So I call this chasing people around with an oxygen mask. Mm -hmm. You need to put your own oxygen mask on first. You need to take care of you first. Because if you're busy chasing other people around with an oxygen mask, first of all, they may not need an oxygen mask. Secondly, they may already have one on. Third, you're going to be laid out in the aisle when that plane lands and they're going to walk over you and say, there's that nice person. Now, especially if you're talking about single parents, and, and I'm glad that you brought up single dads, because that's a, a category that we don't talk about very often. It is so important that you take care of you. So, Find some time, even if it means that you set an alarm for 15 minutes earlier than normal, but have that 15 minutes where it's just you spending time with you and getting to know you and hearing what it is that you are sad about, what you are happy about, what you are uh, scared about, and listen to what it is you have to say to you and start really taking care of you. And that's not selfish because we cannot give from a place of emptiness. And when we start chasing after, you know, whatever we're chasing after, we're trying to make them fill us up. And that's not their job. Well, I'll tell you, you are so full of incredible wisdom. Oh, thank you. That's what we love having here on Crush Your Mountain. You know, so again, when we, it comes to working with you, uh, of course, your books are on Amazon and in other places, I presume. Yes. When it comes to working with you, uh, how can my people, if they choose to reach out to you, where can they find you? Well, the easiest place to find anything and everything about me is to go to my website, which is youcan'teatlove.com. And there you can contact me. If you want to work with me, you can contact me there. Um, if you want to get the books, there are the links to the books on the page as well or on the website as well. Plus, you can see all kinds of before and after pictures of me and you can hear more of my story or see more of my story on uh, the website. So youcan'teatlove.com is the best place to reach out to me, to contact me, and to find out anything that you want to know. Leslie Davis, you have overcome so many things, and then you have given back in so many ways. I have one more question that I ask all of my guests. Leslie Davis, what does it mean to you to crush your mouth? I'm so excited you asked me that. I've been waiting and waiting. <laughs> <laughs> to me, what it means to crush my mountain means that I overcame something that I did not believe I could overcome and that I am now living my very best life because that doubt is out of my way and I'm moving forward. Excellent. That's short and sweet to the point and powerful at that. 
We want to encourage everyone to take the time to show themselves that self-love. Get to know yourself. That's your best friend outside of you, outside of God and outside of your mate. You are the person that you have to take care of first. And so when it comes to weight loss, take the steps to overcome it. Not just in terms of looking good, but for the sake of your health, for the sake of the health of your family. Because in this day and time, the odds are stacked against you. But you can beat the odds if you start showing yourself the love first. And like I always say, don't just climb your mountain, crush through it. Leslie Davis, thank you so very much for being with us. And we friends, we'll see you guys next time.